Well, it looks like we're connected, and I hope that's the case. Uh, we're starting a little early as usual, allow all the uh, tech folks to get us connected uh, through the website as well as through Facebook Live. This is Martin Sabretti, the Vice President of the Calcedon Foundation, and we are here again this Sunday, October 29th, for some Q&A and a little meat of the word. And we do this, uh, normally do this every week. Uh, good afternoon, Doug. Uh, but we're going to change the schedule up during the holidays. We're going to be going every other week, so we will not be here next week, but the week after, and it will proceed probably into January or so, and then we'll go back to a full weekly schedule. So hope that uh, doesn't create any uh, difficulties for anyone else. Uh, I'd love to be able to do it every week, but the end of the year is a very tough time over here. In any event, we have a couple of pending questions, at least one important one that I thought we would touch on first. And it was submitted, and the question has to do with Numbers 30. Numbers 30, is this not a text uh, that is used uh, to control women in the household, whether it be a daughter under a, a father or a uh, wife under the authority of the husband? And the passage has to do with vows and the revocation of vows. Greetings, Charles. Good to hear from South Carolina today. Uh, and so the question then arises, uh, how should we treat this passage in Scripture, in Numbers 30? Is this, as some have argued, uh, arguing from the lesser to the greater? That is to say, uh, all these vows, uh, if the husband can do that vow, then he can uh, essentially overrule the wife on everything. Uh, and that's the way that some folks take this. On the other hand, the uh, proper interpretation of this is that the uh, husband or the uh, father in this case this is the one exception to the rule. And if you actually back up two verses into the previous chapter, you get your context. It's about all the things related to off uh, free will offerings, vows, and things in this order. So these are vows related to gifts to God. That's the context. And this is the one exception to the rule where a wife has uh, agency uh, in her husband's stead. And it's an important point to take that this is the exception to a general rule. And, in fact, it's a very limited exception, as Dr. Reshtoni points out. It's, you have one day from hearing it, the father or the uh, husband, uh, to overrule this free will offering that the uh, wife has um, put forward. In other words, a gift that she wants to give to God. That's what the vow entails, that she wants to do something. And it is a rash vow because women have a more of a religious affection than men do. And they instantly, their heart goes out for compassionate purposes, and they take pity on situations that need it. And therefore, they're more inclined to want to uh, move, lean forward in the saddle and extend the right hand of aid and assistance and make a vow to that end so that God's kingdom would be more firmly established. And it's this predilection, this uh, proclivity, tendency that uh, women have that's actually being governed here because... It may be that the husband or the father might say, well, that's going to put an undue uh, burden on the household that she, in her zeal, is not aware of. And so in this instance, he may, if he hears it within 24 hours, overrule that, and then she is free of the vow. Uh, and it's excused on the grounds of her zeal for God. Uh, and that's it. That's the exception to the rule. So this is not a general principle being enunciated. It's the one exception to the rule. And if it was not... We'd be, one, playing games with the context, the preceding chapter, Numbers 29. And we'd have a whole bunch of examples in Scripture that would fall under uh, all sorts of wild interpretations. Uh, and that's a dangerous thing, too. I have something that, somewhat of an affinity for the particular commentary on Numbers that Dr. Rush Dooney uh, wrote and that Calcedon published. Uh, I'm the person who funded that particular volume in its printing. Uh, I know something about it, therefore. Uh, and I put a dedication in the front of it as well. And I looked through every single word in it. And so it's important for us to uh, grasp the book of Numbers because it's very misunderstood, almost as badly as Leviticus. And in, in this case, we should not be using a text as a sledgehammer by using it wrongly. Uh, it's called massive theological override of the text, where people are going to grab this text and then twist it in such a way, or at least present it in such a way, as to imply that they are interpreting it correctly, and they have this sledgehammer, and they're going to wield it against daughters or against wives, because they say, look, uh, I can overrule you. 
uh, at all times, and here's the text that supports it, this general principle uh, that I can overrule it, uh, down to the smallest, they'll say. So they'll play games with the text. And unfortunately, this creates tyranny. Because what is tyranny but government outside of God's law? So when you take a text and you misuse it, you no longer fall under the rule of First Timothy 1, 8, 9, right? The law is good if used lawfully. This is an unlawful use of the law because it is a twisting of the law of God and therefore does not deliver liberty anymore, but bondage and tyranny in the family. It's used as an excuse. And unfortunately, we see this a lot. I was just examining um, Ezekiel 34 again at length. And it's interesting commentary there on how uh, the, the more powerful sheep and the shepherds deal with them. They're compared uh, as fat sheep to lean sheep at one point in Ezekiel's discussion, God speaking. And it says that the, the fat sheep, they use the side to push, and then they use the shoulder to push, and finally they use the horns to drive you out. And so there's a progression of force that's being applied, and generally this is being applied from folks that are supposed to be the shepherds or function in shepherdly capacity, whether that be pastoral, elderly, um, familial, you know, head of the family and things of this order. In all these cases, uh, we see a violation of the principles of protection and liberty being generated. And so Numbers 30 is not a proof text for any such conduct on the part of fathers and husbands. Uh, contrary, it, it actually is a strict limitation on their authority, and it's the one exception to the rule that all the things that those... Uh, we, for example, if it were true that a, a husband can overrule the vow or any contract entered into by a wife, then no uh, business in the right mind would accept a, ch a... would sell anything to a woman because he said, well, you know, the husband's going to put a stop payment on the check because the Bible says so, right? But the Bible says no such thing because we play games fast and loose with the Scripture. Again, what I call massive theological override of the text. And that always generates problems. If the Word of God delivered perfectly and understood perfectly gives us liberty and freedom, then any deviation from it, to the extent of the deviation, gives us uh, a moral catastrophe on our hands and evil in our midst. And uh, harm being inflicted, again, on those whose, in the particular context here, only uh, error would have been uh, a rash zeal for God. Uh, hardly something that you would punish someone for. So, Numbers 30, not a proof text for that purpose. And uh, I think we've several times put uh, that notion out in, in various uh, formats from the Chalcedon Foundation. And it's important to see this. Uh, uh, Dr. Ashtuni quotes from Watson and Wenham and other authorities on this text, and it's an important aspect of the text. Uh, and it must always be taken in context. And what is that? Vows mentioned in the earlier chapter 29. Those vows are the ones that are being focused on here. So it's a uh, kind of a drill down into one exception of the rule about these vows that would normally hold folks. But women, having more of a religious sense than men, and more bigger heart than men, uh, are going to uh, obviously be the ones that might overstep the authority or the capacity of the family to safely uh, see that vow through to completion. And it's up to the husband or the father to quickly rule on that decision, saying, I'm going to release you of this promise to send this money uh, or this gift to these, these folks. We can't afford it. Uh, so I'll have to overrule what you promised to God. And, and, according, and in that one situation, then the rule of God, law of God would apply, and she would be free of her oath. No, it doesn't apply. Uh, mean anything other than what's already here. It, it means that the husband uh, or the father has a say so in terms of the gift, the gifting of the vows, the free will offerings and vows of the family. And if the wife, uh, say he vowed something himself, and then she, not knowing it, vowed an additional amount to which they couldn't afford, that's the time he needs to speak up and say, "Oh, hold a second, uh, that that's not going to fly in the family." So again, it is not the uh, arguing from the lesser to the greater at all. It is the one exception to the general rule. So that's an important uh, element uh, to take away from this passage, and Dr. Restrain discusses this at length. It's a very destructive interpretation, the other interpretation, by the way. So uh, text out of context is a pretext. In this case, it's a pretext for massive power transfer 
to the husband and to the uh, and to the fathers in the families if this was to be treated as some uh, have treated it, uh, particularly say in the patriarchal movement. Uh, there have been excesses there, and there's been a reaching after texts that might support some of these excesses. And this is one of those abused texts that needs to be delivered from the hand of those who would misuse it. Again, the law of God is uh, good if used lawfully, and that's an important principle to use and to seek. Uh, so I think that would uh, answer the original question related to Numbers 30 and its relationship to this matter. There has certainly been some discussion in-house at Chalcedon about this text, uh, because it certainly has come to the front and say, well, this God spends some ink on this, right? Uh, must must be something important here. Uh, but it really is a re reflection of something very interesting to me, and this goes back to a comment that Dr. Rushtuni made. Uh, when they were analyzing the relative um, strengths and weaknesses of men and women, across all sorts of things that they were tested. And it turns out that in all but two situations, two cases, m women are superior to men. The two where the women are not as strong as men would have been uh, dominion aggression and abstract thinking. And those two men in general would be better than women. But all the other capacities, women were much stronger than men. Now, unfortunately, the problem with uh, d domination or dominion is that in a sinful situation, that doesn't tend toward freedom at all. It definitely tends toward uh, lording it over others. So it tends to be bent or distorted to a less than a godly goal. Uh, in fact, perhaps even contrary to a godly goal for it. So it's only when a dominion is after the law of God that it's a good thing, and also that abstract thinking would also be a good thing. Uh, so we have to acknowledge that these particular strengths that a man have, uh, they're also a, a subject to what's called the noetic effects of sin, these effects of sin on the mind and the thinking and the volition, the will of man, and those hell have a part to play in that. So upshot is we must be mindful of the restrictions of what God's law is telling us about. We cannot just simply take um, a principle, unless there's a good and necessary inference from it, both good and necessary, and extend it. Lots of times those extensions don't fly. It's the reason that the uh, Jews were willing to stone to death a tailor who walked too far on the Sabbath with a needle in his pocket, even if he didn't know about it. Uh, that was a capital crime so far as the Jews were concerned. Now, that's not a capital crime in Scripture, but that's what happens when you don't use the good and necessary inference rule. And inferences are always going to be more dangerous than anything that's laid out straight in Scripture where you have a handle on it. Uh, and it's an important point to take. I think just earlier this week I was dealing with a similar situation where a given text was being used, and it has a, had a very, uh, in fact, it was Daniel, um, sorry, Deuteronomy 25.11. It deals with this, what happens if two men are fighting, and the wife of one of the men gets involved in the fight. And then all sorts of questions were asked, well, what happens if the woman's being raped by a man, and what if the uh, man's trying to murder the woman? Guess what? That text begins with a situation where two men are fighting, and there's a third party involved that's interfering with the fight between the two men. And uh, so what happens is that it's being stretched and, and mangled and pulled apart to apply to things which the text itself says it's not about. So the text must be applied properly. If a theonomist is misapplying the Word of God, he's going to lead people astray. He's then the blind guide leading other people into the ditch with himself. And that's a catastrophe just waiting to happen. So if, we're, uh, if zeal outruns knowledge of Scripture, we're going to be in huge trouble because we will be pushing with passionate force error and falsehood and ultimately wickedness because if it conflicts with the law of God, uh, then our claim to being lawful and righteous and just falls flat on its face. I, see. I don't think we've had any questions yet. I must be because I'm on some kind of a monopolistic role here, and that can happen uh, in these cases. Um, so, do we have any other um, questions at the moment? We have nine viewers, which is nice to have. And uh, as this weather has turned, You know, they say silence on radio is death to the announcer. So, 
good thing Christ has conquered death, even the death of radio silence. I rejoice in that too. I'm sure you do too, folks. What happens under these situations that I might end up talking about something that interests me? I did. He asked, he asked that. How does that apply to derived authority and submission? And I'm pretty sure that I, I replied to it. I don't believe it is uh, um, applies, and certainly in the sense that most people have tried to apply it. It uh, really has to do with rashness. And by the way, if the man makes a rash oath, he does have to uh, keep it. He, there's no out for him at all. Uh, that at that point, Psalm 15 verse 4 comes into play. Man keeps his promise even to his own hurt. Uh, he's obligated to keep uh, the promise, the vow to God. And again, keeping in mind that it has to do with the vows that are referred to in Numbers 29, not any general contract or attempts to stretch and extend it to essentially uh, block in a woman to have zero authority or power of any kind. Uh, that's why Dr. Rushduni pointed out all sorts of texts in Scripture that uh, people, pastors, don't want to, to preach on that relate to um, the other side of Sarah and Abraham's relationship. What role then does the passage of the head of the woman is man, and but the head of the man is Christ? Okay, that's a very interesting point. The, the, um, I generally uh, have a, a particular uh, individual in mind whose exposition of that text uh, I prefer, and let me think if I can recall who it is. Uh, he was in the content, the context of the matter of head coverings and um, silence in churches, and of course this text comes up in in the uh, in discussion of that. I'll have to track that down. It might come up in my uh, just by raw recollection as I'm discussing it, and that is where I think the, the exposition given there by that particular scholar who was at Westminster um, might have been. Hurley, I think it was. Uh, Hurley was the one who, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was the one I'm thinking of. And it was his exposition of those passages. So I think he came up with the best uh, exposition uh, all told, which avoided all the problems of the text that lead up to it and, and uh, are derived from that. So, uh, And let's also point out that now we are in a New Testament setting here, and therefore, whatever is being proposed here should not be in conflict with a ordinance related to free will offerings and vows, gifts to God over in Numbers 29 and Numbers 30. Uh, there should be as a harmony of interest between these things. Uh, so that, that's an important point to take. So I have to then go, yeah, James B. Hurley is finally coming back to me now. And uh, Douglas, if you're interested, I can probably send a PDF of that to you um, probably tomorrow. Uh, and then you can tell me if you think the exposition flies. I think it's very profound and strong. That is correct. Andrea did uh, make a reference uh, to the text, uh, Hurley's discussion on uh, protection and covering. Uh, uh, and it's true she doesn't entirely agree, but she did uh, see that there was a, at least one principle at stake that uh, all sides could uh, take home and, and work with. So, though it's compelling to me exegetically, uh, that's my call, and uh, it may not be necessarily uh, Andrea's call or someone else's call, or it might even not even be Douglas's call. But then at that point, we'd want to engage and say, what is weak about this exposition? What's the better exposition? Why is one alleged to be better than another? Uh, and then, then we, we say we grapple with it. That's what Dr. Bonson kept saying. We need to have hand-to-hand -hand exegetical combat to resolve tough questions like this. Now, that exposition of Hurley's has been standing since 1977, so it's not as if you know, that puts us, what, at the 40, 50-year mark? Uh, so if it's been around for a half century, there's plenty of time for people to attack it resoundingly, and I'm unaware and have st kept looking at this question to see anyone who's actually done any due diligence in knocking it down. Okay, uh, Charles Roberts, I do not mind a change in uh, topic, but chances are we'll come back to the other one anyway. Uh, what commentaries on the book of Revelation do you recommend and why? Uh, it's more of the ones that I don't recommend at this point. Uh, a lot of the uh, scholars uh, that have done damage to our understanding of the book of Revelation uh, continue to uh, accumulate uh, large bankrolls, I think, teaching error. And I think this is a catastrophe because sensationalism sells. 
even in selling, say, a preterist commentary, uh, it, it's easier to sell it if you put a sensationalist cover on the book. I, and that just speaks to the, the fact that it's people who are Christians, not dogs or robots. Uh, and we're easily swayed by presentation, the, the outer covering of the thing. So, uh, what what sources do I go to for Revelation, Book of Revelation? First, I have to realize that there's uh, at least three legitimate interpret approaches to the book uh, that at least have currency and I think should be respected. Uh, the historicist approach. Apart from anything else, it has a lot of history on its side insofar as it's been, it's called and claimed to be the Reformed or the Reformation position on the Book of Revelation. And a modern expositor of that that I think uh, ha has a lot of um, firepower is Francis Nigel Lee, the late Dr. Lee. And his commentary is available for free online as a PDF and worth reading through all the way. So if you want to get a position on the historicist view, that's one of the stronger ones. And it is post-millennial. One could also have a uh, historicist view and end up pre-millennial with, say, uh, Eliot's work, Hore Apocalypte, uh, which is a massive work in its own right and uh, in the service of a pre-millennial notion versus a post-millennial notion as promoted by Dr. Lee. Interestingly, Dr. Lee's view of the um, millennium is such that uh, there is no final apostasy. He believes everyone will be saved to the last man, which puts him in the same company as Warfield, myself, uh, late Dr. Resh Dooney, uh, other scholars who've uh, looked at this matter. So, uh, historicist, I think the best commentary would be Lee's, and it's available for free on the internet to read as a PDF. I don't know if it's ever been uh, put into print but uh, that's a good one. On preterist commentaries, we have a range of opinion, and some of the ones that have uh, gained currency uh, have, in my view, some debilitating features. Uh, for example, if you were to go for Chilton's um, Days of Vengeance, uh, which I have a couple copies of here, it's influenced by uh, some interpretive maximalism that James B. Jordan brought to the table. Uh, and so that particular um, book uh, suffers, and Dr. Bonson, in fact, reviewed it and had some similar comments about it that I made in, in respect to the book and its treatment of uh, theology. It, it stretches some things too far, and that creates um, hazardous uh, interpretations. But it's certainly out there as an alternative. Uh, Dr. Gentry's book would be uh, probably one of the strongest in the area, and Dr. Bonson's commentary from a preterist perspective would be of value. Now, if you want to avoid all the 20th and 21st century um, hullabaloo, what you do is you go acquire a copy of um, Moses Stewart's book for a preterist interpretation of uh, Revelation. The two volumes, very old, from the 1840s or 50s, I think, and sitting there on my shelf as well. And so that's another way to go. And uh, that leaves us with, for example, the idealist point of view. And you have on mills and post mills adopting the idealist point of view. I happen to think it's the correct view. And so uh, I have to side with Warfield. When he uh, was recommending commentaries on Revelation, he listed six individuals. Uh, Alfred, Lee, and Hengstenberg were in the list. And after he list, listed three, he says, these six will be found closest to the truth, which is to say he hedged his bets. He said there's, there's no really good one yet. <laughs> it's yet to be written. Uh, there's someone still has to synthesize all this material. So out of these six, he says, you can get somewhere, and uh, William Lee uh, and uh, Ernest Wilhelm Hengstenberg, my, one of my preferred ones, and uh, Alford, Henry Alford, of course, is a great expositor and, and Greek scholar. So that would be the place that we would start with an idealist uh, commentary. Dr. Rushtuni's commentary itself is an idealist commentary on Revelation but it's more of a theological, ideological uh, commentary than it is exegetical, certainly not a word-by-word -word exposition of the text. It leans on a lot of other scholars to put its position forward, and then it draws conclusions. So it's rather unique, and therefore, if you're not ready for that kind of read of Rosh um, Thy Kingdom Come, it, it can be a, a very difficult read for you, because it doesn't read like theology sometimes. It reads, uh, he sees the implications of ideas, and he brings those to the surface. And other folks miss it, or they're, they're so involved in the trees, they don't see the forest. Dr. Rishton, is a forest kind of guy. He he's the, sees the big picture in each section of Revelation, and a lot of people miss that. 
And he even, say, he even said, he says, I might be wrong about the details, but I'm right about this, that it's about victory. So I wouldn't have to agree on that. So if folks put the gun to my head and say, what do you recommend? Uh, for, I would say, for Revelation 1 to the 18th chapter, I think Hengstenberg is one of the strongest. Uh, after that, it falls apart, because he thought the uh, millennium lasted from about eight, 800 40 A.D. to 1840 A.D., and it ended in, 18, in the 19th century. So obviously something went wrong with that interpretation, just like something went wrong with Johann Albrecht Bengel's interpretation in his commentary on Revelation. Lots of times if you um, make the wrong misstep, history will prove you to be wrong, and then you'll be uh, in the dump heap of exegesis again. So let's see, and, and of course... I would probably undertake to write such a commentary if God gives me the, the, the thing, and I would be synthesizing it, and what Warfield does. Find the best of all of them and put them together in a package that makes sense. Uh, I like Milligan's work in Revelation. He was chosen to do the expositor's commentary. It's, it tends to be amillennial versus uh, victory-oriented, but there's a lot of good stuff there in Milligan's work. Uh, I have acquired a copy of... Uh, uh, his name is Kleithoth, Kleithoth. Uh, tough German name, Theodor uh, Detlef Kleithoth. Man, that's a tough one. K-L-I-E-F-O-T-H, Kleithoth. And uh, it's in German, so it takes some effort for me to uh, translate theolo theological concepts into the English. That's my native language. Uh, but this is the guy that Warfield said was the Sharpie. He kept quoting Kleithoth, and then Milligan, who was developing off of Kleithoth's ideas, for the idealist interpretation. So I think I'm spending a lot of time on this to say uh, it's not here yet. I, prefer, I, I tend to prefer idealist commentaries, um, though I have high respect for Dr. Lee, and I think the preterists are still in the running. I think they have some weaknesses that they need to work out uh, and to get on a much solid, more solid f uh, footing versus the whistling in the dark saying, well, we saw these kind of things, and the, the, your objections don't matter. Well, in our view, they do matter. And they can be answered more forthrightly than has happened to date. And most of these scholars are sharp enough to be able to pull that off, uh, given enough resources. So, and, uh, as Warfield would say, so long as there's one plausible thing to be said for any point of view, it should be put on the table, because these are important matters. We want to get the book right. So, let's see what happened there. Okay, as a matter of fact, um, I'm going to bop back to the idealist position again, and then uh, and I'll explain the differences between all views of uh, Scripture, of Revelation. Uh, but the question about the front cover article on Chalcedon's Faith for All of Life magazine last issue it was Malachi 4 in the homeschooling movement, and we published an article written uh, three or four years ago by Pastor Sean Mathis, an OPC pastor up in Colorado. And it created uh, two different kinds of responses. Online responses, which ran 70% favorable, about 30% unfavorable. And then written responses, where someone took the trouble to write uh, uh, or type a letter and put a stamp on it and send it to us. And the ones that were sent that way were 100% negative. Someone was okay with the article, they didn't write us. But if, uh, at least not physical, snail mail, but those who didn't like it objected to it strongly and... Send it. So uh, we actually are publishing, I think it's about a three, four page response explaining what's going on with this article, and I think it should set most people's minds at rest who had an objection to it. Uh, I don't want to steal the thunder, only to say uh, we consulted with Dan Smithwick. We consulted even with the former clerk of session in, in Colorado to establish some of those charges against the author, uh, or in this case, disestablishment, and show that they had no basis. Uh, and also to deal with uh, the entire question of the interpretation of the data. Uh, I think the most serious challenge was, well, two kinds. Uh, serious challenges were that it was it, this information could be used to harm the homeschool movement, which would be the last thing they would do since we support it 100%, 1,000%. Uh, I've put a ton of my energy into the homeschooling movement to encourage it. And as I mentioned in the article, I don't mind stealing this thunder from myself, uh, when folks have asked me over the last 10 years, oh, what do you see in America that gives you any hope at all? I said, homeschooling movement. That is the one thing. And I mentioned it in my introduction to the article because it ex it's an example of Christian self-government where we're taking away uh, stuff that the state does and doing it ourselves. And that is a good thing, and that's a positive thing, and that's to be acclaimed. 
and encouraged that we have more of it. And so I, I go into detail on that aspect of it. And then the second serious question is, is the pastor Mathis here not uh, emphasizing a church-centered approach to revival versus a family-centered approach to revival? Uh, so, which is a legitimate question. Uh, and in our view, uh, it's the family that ultimately is the, the source. And we took, I took one of his interpretations of revival and it demonstrated that by his standard, the homeschooling movement actually does qualify uh, in a very important way. Because if people are coming out of public school with a kid into homeschooling, that is widespread repentance, which Mathis says is an example or a sign of a true revival. That would be my point. The whole purpose of the article, by the way, was not to set off public school against homeschooling, which is very obvious, I point out, because why on earth would the author use the Peers test, which is a biblical worldview test developed by the Nehemiah Institute, uh, as the reference point? Unless, and of course, under that test, the, homes, the uh, public school students are down in the bottom. And by the way, traditional Christian schools are down there with them. The only ones that are doing well are the biblical worldview schools, which explicitly teach a biblical worldview, and of course the homeschoolers, which are somewhat lower. So we reproduced the entire graph uh, thanks to the um, permission of Daniel Smithwick, who was very gracious to talk to me and speak to this almost half hour we spoke on the question of the interpretation of his data and what it means. And so we're, we're publishing that. And I think this should set to rest the uh, small brush fire that seemed to ignite because uh, it was chosen by our art director as the front cover article. And I think there's folks that simply have issues with uh, Pastor Mathis to start with. And uh, they'll need to take that up with, with him. But my point of view is we look, we publish based on the merits of the article. And our interest, as we said in my introduction, is to not put good Christian schools in competition with home schools as if one was good and the other was bad. Rather, Rashtun also supported both of them. So he wanted to support Christian schools and home schools. And he wanted to support Christian schools that were sold out on the Word of God and founded everything on the, on the Word of God. And if you want to know how he thinks that should be shaped, get a copy of The Philosophy of the Christian Curriculum, which not only is free online to look at, it actually is his uh, doctoral dissertation for Valley Christian University, for those who didn't know that. So that's what's going to happen uh, in terms of cleaning up uh, the fallout from this apparently controversial article. What were the positive folks? You know, we always talk about the folks that uh, were unhappy with the article. What about, what about those who were happier with the article, who liked it? They said it opened their eyes to things they hadn't considered, which was kind of the old intent, saying there's more here to the picture, and we want to show the whole picture. And the truth sets you free. It sets you free. Also, it can help you chart your course. And so if there's more work to be done by homeschooling to bring them up to the level of the biblical worldview Christian schools, why not get cracking on that? Why uh, shake a fist? Uh, so it makes more sense for us to say, let's take this information and, and use it. Uh, it's a metric that can be valuable in assessing where we are and where we need to go. And that's the point of it. Thank you for that list here. Now I'm going to go back and see what was the question. Oh, yes. Um, Calcine Foundation, I know these folks. Could you elaborate on the idealist position and why it appeals to you? Okay. This might shock a lot of folks. I think of all the past, all the interpretations of Scripture, the idealist is the closest one that can probably come closest to taking more of Scripture literally than any other, including the Book of Revelation. Not in terms of the symbols, but at least in terms of their import. And it takes. We always talk about in Scripture analysis about this idea of the analogy of Scripture. Use the analogy of Scripture, which is a shorthand or more longhand for the shorthand, Scripture interprets Scripture. So the idealist interpretation uh, sees an effect. Uh, let me just wind back a step. Preterism says that the entire book applies to about three and a half years between 66 to 70 AD. So it squeezes all of it into about three and a half years in that time period. Futurism tends to put it into seven years or three and a half years in the future yet to happen, but it compacts everything in the book into a very short span of time. Historicism and idealism share one thing in common, but it's an important thing. It says the contents of the book extend across all of time between the two advents, between the first advent 
and the second advent. And in fact, some parts you could say extends even just before the first advent, because Christ is born in Revelation 12, but one who were to interpret that passage as it stands. And that's how the book begins. I'm going to show you what was, what is, and what is to come. So we expect to have some history, and in fact, uh, in the idealist view, it actually goes back all the way to Egypt in Moses' time in Revelation 13. The first head of the beast would be Egypt. The second head of the beast would be Assyria. So we have two world kingdoms. Then the four kingdoms in the book of Daniel would follow, uh, from Babylon, Medo-Persia, uh, Macedonia, and in Rome, the sixth head that now is. So we have charting course of empire, so this beast is all selective world empires that ruled over the entire world at that time uh, congealed into one entity as one flowed into the others. Each one consumed the one before it. It became the beast, and the other heads became inactive, and then that head became active. And when John wrote, the sixth head was active, but when it disappeared, the seventh head, which has ten horns on it, which means all, in the idealist, idealist interpretation, means all, a multiplicity of nations, uh, arise, and those ten which are not literally ten in the idealist view, um, uh, essentially destroy false prophecy, false religion. They burn up the whore, hate her, and destroy her. And some of the Puritans, like John Owen, saw this coming and explained that that's what's happened. They convert to Christ. All these nations convert to Christ, and they destroy false religion. They are enforcing the first table of the law. And that's a very post-millennial thing, and most people don't see it. So the difference between the historicist view and the idealist view, which both say it extends between the advents, is the historicist believes it's sequential. It's in chronological order from one end to the other. Whereas the idealist says it's actually seven consecutive visions which all look at the same uh, thing, the same events between the advents from different points of view, different aspects. So the visions are essentially ideal. They don't point to an exact sequence in history except for various trends within each of these uh, visions and the, each of the visions can you can split them to create the impression that there is um, not a victory at the end, or you can split them where there is always a victory at the end. Uh, I would split them when there's a victory at the end. Some of them are almost too simple to avoid. Uh, all, behold, all the kings of the world have become the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall reign forever. It's in Revelation eleven fifteen. How do you get that sequentially to have happened? Uh, in a historicist view, and how can that fit inside a great tribulation or in the Vespasianic War back in the Roman era? Uh, it's very hard to fit these passages. But they do make sense in the idealist passage. They say there were seven consecutive visions, all in, which end with a victory of uh, the gospel over the world and Christ conquering everything. And one of the examples we gave already is in the 17th chapter related to the destruction of the, uh, the harlot. Uh, one of the breaks occurs, believe it or not, at a very bad chapter break, 8-1. 8-1 is actually the completion of the vision. It's half, In the course of the one day when the Patmos visions were being delivered, there was nothing happening for 30 minutes. There was silence in heaven for 30 minutes. Now, heaven is not a silent place. Do you know why? Because whenever God's law is being broken, God's wrath, and, the, and you see the manifestations of it in heaven, is being uh, revealed in thunderings and lightnings and, and the threatenings. and But all of a sudden, why is there peace in heaven? Because there's peace on earth. Because there is no more resistance to Christ uh, and his rule. He no longer is fighting for uh, on beside his saints and with them and through them, and through their martyrdoms even. Uh, victory has been attained at that point. Uh, most people miss it. They just think it's just a half hour preceding the next thing rather than the, a massive conclusion that there's finally peace when there has been no peace in heaven this entire time. There's been nothing but lightnings and thunderings from heaven as a result of the prayers going up and then the, the um, judgments coming down. No judgments for a whole half hour. M if men were sinning as wildly as they usually do, that can't happen. But it can happen in the post millennial view uh, when, when we pass all the way into victory. So that's the whole point of the idealist view, is it sees... The book of Revelation is a series of visions, which is kind of how we look at Isaiah, Ezekiel, other things, a series of visions, which uh, take up various points. And the vision, visions in the book of Revelation, under idealist interpretation, reflect the, uh, the, the victory of Christ over time, and it sees it from different angles and different points of view. 
So that's what that's all about. Uh, idealism takes the whole book of Revelation as falling between the Advents. That means that we could take something literally like the amount of blood uh, that's being shed from the wine press of the wrath of God. It goes up to the uh, bridles of the horses for 1600 stadia, and that's the blood of about 20 billion people, uh, which is a lot of people. We don't have enough people there. We, this argument has been used very cleverly by, say, uh, Gary DeMar when he says, you know, you can't have 200 million Chinese on horseback crossing the Euphrates because there's only 50 or 60 million horses in the entire world. I mean, we're, we're shy, 140 million horses. We'd have to quadruple the amount of horses or to, to even make it possible for that vision to occur on principles of um, futurist dispensationalism. It can't happen. You can't get there. And the same problem, I think, arises with blood for this amount to that length. Uh, if it were to be t considered anywhere remotely literal, that amount of blood, it, uh, we don't have enough people today to have it for a single war. And we can't have any, any others. Any, but an idealist can say all the blood shed that was in opposition to Christ for, for millennia, that could total that amount. So am I uh, saying, am I being adamant about that interpretation? No. But I'm putting out there saying something could actually fit here, and no one's considering this, uh, that there's something more to it. Now, there are those who will say 1600 stadia, that's a covenantal measure. And we can hide all sorts of things by saying it's a covenantal measure. And if we say that enough times, it's a covenantal book, it's a covenantal measure. We're come dangerously close to playing the game of the early allegorists. And I think that that becomes problematic because we're trying to make certain claims about the book of Revelation. Uh, and we backpedal too much. And I think if we we're backpedaling all the time, there's something to be said about the interpretation that forces us to do that. Yes, there it is. Uh, Charles Roberts posted the uh, Historicist Commentary by Dr. Lee. To show what kind of scholar Dr. Lee is, he was friendly toward Rushtuni, who's an idealist. They talked and spoke about the Book of Revelation constantly. They didn't agree on everything, but they agreed, agreed on a lot, uh, because, the current, of course, the main thing is the book applies between the Advents. So we're to see the proper home for Revelation's prophecies to be in the present, and in the last 19 centuries, and unknown amount into the future, while that victory is working itself out, as the Spirit is being poured out upon all flesh, as uh, the ministers of Christ going out to reconcile the world to Christ, uh, and Christ uh, to the world to his Father. So all these processes are going on, uh, and so they would be able to work on it. But again, Dr. Lee goes ahead and quotes from some of my material in the book on Revelation 20. And I'm not an historicist, yet he quotes it, and he quotes it favorably. Uh, we, we happen to agree on something, maybe that's why. But nonetheless, it shows that he went beyond his own school of thought to get the best that he could find in terms of uh, expositional um, feedback and, and, and ideas. He wasn't narrow in his view. He wasn't closed-minded. He was willing to say, uh, I'm not the arbiter of truth. I need to look beyond. What I think is important for Christians today to do is not look to the 20th and 21st century current scholars. You need to dig farther back in time. Uh, I think the um, on the book of Revelation, you should at least have a half dozen commentaries written in the 19th century. D uh, as I say, in, in, and he quotes me, Dr. Levy quotes me, for there to be any pretense of completeness, you need to dig farther back in time one of the reasons is that the scholarship back then was better than current scholarship. Current scholarship is weak and anemic compared to what we had. So we have a tremendous Christian heritage here, even among all schools of thought, pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennial. And, uh, but if you're only working with what just got published this year, that's a sad commentary on ourselves. Uh, we need to de be deeper, and uh, there's a verse in Isaiah 54, you know, look to the rock from whence you were hewn, look to the pit from whence you were digged. Find out where your theology came from. Find out where the root of your eschatologies, and compare them at the root, not just who's what's being said today. Now, it's possible where some good I I new ideas are coming out today that have merit, that have been missed. Uh, it's been said that, the, what, there are 666 different interpretations of 666. And 
I remember Charles Hodge making a commentary in his Systematic Theology, uh, speaking about the prophecies about the Messiah. And he was coming on the second coming prophecies, but he says, let's consider also uh, regarding the first. He says, you know, to the hundreds of thousands of people in Israel to whom the prophecies of the Messiah were revealed, not a single person, so far as it appears, interpreted them aright. And that's a huge, stunning condemnation of how dense we are. So we need to do better. And one way is to consider the rock from whence we're hewn, the pit from whence we're digged. Go back to the earlier commentaries, move yourself forward in your study, get your context under you, get your legs under you. Uh, I'll tell you what happens when you don't when that, you don't do that. This is very simple, because this is about the trick that Hal Lindsey played. When he was confronted with you know, the Reformation ideas, he said this, quote, Luther and Calvin were in darkness concerning prophecy, unquote. So what has he done? He's just basically uh, discredited everyone from that era as not understanding prophecy because only Hal Lindsey understands that it has to do with Israel's Reformation in 1948 and Jerusalem being retaken in 1967. So don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. And if they're in darkness, then you should only listen to someone who has been talking about uh, Rev, uh, Israel in the dispensational setting. So by this sleight of hand, uh, he throws out the Reformation understanding of the book of Revelation. And that is a bad thing to do. You should at least understand it. Even if you disagree with it, you should read it and understand it. Because these men did not come to their opinions lightly, even if they were driven by dogmatic considerations, which means... Uh, they had a tiff with the Pope, and it was advantageous to find the papacy in Scripture, and then perhaps inject this notion into our creeds and confessions. For better or worse, they're there. I think probably for the worse. Uh, I think there's a problem with interpreting Antichrist that way. I think Warfield did a much better job with the doctrine of the Antichrist in his article, The Antichrist, uh, and it should be consulted with the prophet for anyone interested in that matter. Okay. Can we also consider the blood of the preborn through abortion? I do consider this a battle and a war. I do believe that uh, we are in a, misery, a tremendous uh, bloodshed. I mean, one of the saddest, some comment, one of the saddest websites on earth, I think, is, is a website, you know, abortions in the world. I guess it keeps track of all the, the slaughter going on. It's a huge issue. <clears throat> and strategy is being questioned, rightly so, in my view. Uh, how well is the pr um, pro-life music movement doing? Pretty badly. Um, with some of the victories that are claimed, who needs defeats? Uh, I don't have to go into this other than to say uh, the, the battle between incrementalism and immediatism, and you need to define immediatism properly. Uh, it's not revolutionary uh, in the sense of how it's to be achieved, but it does set the goal properly. If you... Uh, you're only going to hit the target that you aim for, and if you're hitting a target that's too low, you're not going to get where you're going. Instead, you're going to be st go there stepwise, and a lot of lives to be paid for a bad strategy. Okay, so, yeah, I have to agree with uh, Douglas that uh, the blood of the preborn is a, is a huge issue. Uh, and it, of course, uh, and I think he's probably putting this into play in terms of the blood of the Ryan... See, uh, now, the issue there is that there's a difference between the blood that's the, from the wrath of the wine, wine of the wrath of God, versus the shedding of innocent blood, which pollutes the land. I think the blood of uh, the preborn through abortion is the latter category. It's blood that pollutes the land, and the inhabitants will ultimately be vomited out of it. I do not think you necessarily have to take that as a Israel-only thing. It is the land. You know, it's the same land that drank the blood of. Uh, Abel and cried out to God. I think the blood that's shed into the earth always cries out to God. And a cry comes up to God and he answers it with, you don't want to know. I tell you that. It's, his wrath is, is terrifying. Okay. Andrea Schwartz asks, could you comment on the process believers should utilize when brothers sincerely disagree with each other? How far can we go in agreeing to disagree? That's an interesting question. It depends, I guess, from one point of view, what's at stake. Uh, if it is what we call academic disagreement, that is, there is no catastrophe that's going to arise from people taking one side or the other, uh, I don't think that's, that's a huge problem. If lives are in the balance, then I think we're going to have to do more than just agreeing to disagree. That's okay for lives to be lost. 
the cost then of um, being gracious is too high. At that point, righteous anger and indignation probably needs to be front and center. Brothers who are both committed to the Word of God should be able to uh, move in terms of that. But what happens, and I've seen this a lot on Facebook, where all our weaknesses are front and center and amplified tenfold, what happens is something gets in front of the interpretation of the Scripture, which is a personal animus, a uh, personal hostilities, a, personal att uh, a scriptural attack comes off sometimes as a personal attack. And some individuals are more prone to a personal attack, uh, perhaps because their patience is stretched thin. Uh, patience is something that's required of Christians. So I don't think it can be excused. But by the same token, if we're only going to argue about the man and go ad hominem and say, you know, he is a, uh, he d said such and so, and he has this view of this, and therefore I'm not going to give him the time of day on this other topic, uh, then we have more serious problems stake. Because we do not know from what corner a better understanding of Scripture can suddenly arise. And if that's the case, the last thing we should be doing is uh, ruling it out. And that, that can get us in, in other trouble, because now we're letting something else guide us, which is our, our personal feelings. And the heart of man is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things, who can know it. So when our heart misleads us, it, it's not how things should run. We are supposed to be governed by God and His law in everything. So that that's an important element. We do, in other words, we do very poorly, poorly at the interpersonal things to start with, especially on Facebook, and especially where uh, folks have expectations that perhaps are unrealistic. And uh, then next thing you know, people are being unfriended, blocked, and uh, so we're just agreeing to block one another. That's what it boils down to as opposed to keeping the lines of communication open, uh, because there's always hope if there's, if there's communication. Once we shut communications down, then at that point, the two brothers are in complete isolation from each other. And perhaps that, that suits them, which is, again, a sad commentary on where we're at. Instead of working, as Zephaniah 3.9 says, with, uh, with one shoulder, to work with one shoulder, shoulder to shoulder is how we would say it in English, but it's not that way in Hebrew. To work with one shoulder, there has to be this uh, commonality of purpose and where we have all these reasons to reject each other's person, each other's person, uh, then the ideas are also shortchanged. And at that point, we create our own personal ghettos. The other side creates their personal ghetto too. So there is a hardening of positions and no more concourse, no more discussions, uh, no more dialogue, a loss of how to dialogue. Uh, for example, if we're going to com comment on, say, preterism versus idealism, you'd want to get folks into the game that are inclined to be gracious to a fault with the other side and appreciative of other points of view. Uh, Dr. Gentry is in this category with respect to preterism. He's a strong exponent of it, and he will listen graciously and interact with opposing views. Uh, but some people are not that way. Some people are my way or the highway, and uh, soon we're going to get the blocking going on and not have a dialogue at all. What pleases Christ? I think Christ is pleased when we approach each other with grace because we're all bought with the price. So for us to think differently, that someone owes us a living, uh, is going to be dangerous. But most people see things badly on Facebook because, they, I've said it many times, it lacks in. Reflection. You don't know the sense or the meaning or the motivation behind a comment because it's, uh, it loses all that loading that would have. For example, if I say something here and I have a certain hand expression and a facial tick going on with it, you might say, well, he was joking or he was being expansive or he was giving an example or he was being tentative. You would know all these things, but you wouldn't know that in a Facebook post at all, uh, unless it was very long and lengthy and he explained I mean, this is a joke, and of course it ruins a joke just to telegraph it. But if you say it too late, they say, well, that wasn't a joke. We didn't think it was funny. In fact, we thought it was really offensive, and the people are offended. Thank you. That's a great commentary. And, uh, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. So here's an emphasis from Paul, and I love the, the final verse of Revelation 12, um, Romans 12, sorry, in particular. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
So if someone is coming at you, throwing shade, as they say today's lingo, uh, you extend light into the shade. You don't fight the shade directly. You um, It's the glory of a man to overlook an offense. We have so much opportunity for glory in Facebook. Have you noticed this? And we don't take advantage of it. And we should. We should absorb the offense and then still be gracious back. When it's time to become a little stronger in your position because someone is being obtuse, uh, recalcitrant, then you don't rush it up fast. Move incre incrementally there yeah, because you want to be slow to anger. That's a plus. Quick to hear, slow to speak even. Listen. Lots of times I'll listen and, and pay attention to a long thread before I decide to find I might have something positive or edifying to add to it. So our personal conduct as Christians engaging in complex ideas of Scripture needs to do a lot better than we're doing. Our uh, intentions are good, but our execution is, is woeful lots of times because we don't have good examples to follow in this arena. And if we lack the examples, then we have to create our own examples and, and start fresh. Be the example. Be the role model in this regard. Uh, yes, you can uh, flame someone private messaging, and I'm sure that's not what Chalcedon meant, but that's what happens when uh, lots of times admins say, why don't you two take it offline in private message? This is not within the scope of this group, this discussion group. And sometimes that helps because what happens when it's private, um, people don't feel that they are under obligation to make them uh, to defend themselves publicly against what looks as uh, perceived as an attack on them and their ability to understand scripture. The other point is that everyone has to be willing to say, uh, I might have this scripture wrong. Uh, I, I, I don't think so, but I have to allow for that possibility. And most of us uh, are, aren't, aren't willing to be teachable on scripture. That's what it boils down to be teachable means to admit that you don't have all the truth, and that you in fact do see through the glass darkly as Paul affirmed in 1 Corinthians 13. So it's important to have that right. We can do better in this area, and I think at the moment we don't do as well as we should. We have five more minutes, and any other um, pressing comments, uh, questions that we might be able to deal with before we shut down for the for until the week after. Again, we'll be going every other week um, until the holidays are over, into January approximately. And I'll let everyone know when we're going weekly again. Uh, I enjoy our time together. It, it's a blessing to me to be able to be here and to speak to you uh, on behalf of the Chalcedon Foundation and on behalf of God. And to the extent that I'm weak in either, I uh, pray that God's grace is extended to me as well. Any other questions? Looks a lot. We're going to probably try a different technology next uh, time around, which allows me, we're going to go to a laptop instead of an iPhone, and that should allow us to uh, me to see the entire question Yes, right, 11-12 will be when we see again. Well, I'll see the entire question instead of uh, only the top four lines, which has been kind of the bane of our <laughs> our use of the iPhone as our preferred way of going. Last question from Douglas. Do you consider the current Reconstruction Movement theonomist? <coughs> Good way to make me cough there, Douglas. Reconstruction has always been termed a locus, a confluence of the ideas of presuppositional apologetics, uh, theonomic ethics, uh, post-millennial eschatology, and almost always uh, the five points of Calvinism. So it's kind of eight-point Calvinism, I call it, because you add the apologetic component to the eschatology and the ethics to arrive at eight-point Calvinism. Uh, so I'm an eight-pointer at that point. And I think when what, what we have here are what I hope are internecine conflicts, which is um, internal debates over the extent of the law of God, the judicial law, and how much of it is still binding, and how to classify it. There is still dispute over whether there should be a three-way split of the law classification, the three-way uh, uh, and so popular to nowadays. Uh, I think there are more likely to be five or seven different classifications of, of biblical law, not the three that are common. And there's reasons that motivate some of these classifications of God's law, the dividing it into these different partitions, and what belongs under a partition. And this creates very interesting uh, comments and co commentaries. Someone was quoting John Owen recently, saying, see, look at all these arbitrary laws that God throws out there. So 
the way to attack that is to say, let's walk through every single, first off, you shouldn't have to even answer that, but if you were to accept that idea, uh, then you would go through and say, well, why is it this least commandment of God about what to do with um, a bird, a mother bird on the ground with the nest with its eggs? Deuteronomy 22, verses 6 and 7. Is that arbitrary? It's because it does say, if you observe this law, your days will be long in the land that the Lord God giveth thee. So the same promise as the fifth commandment. That's certainly not arbitrary. So the prom same promise with the least amount of... Uh, um, the smallest law of God involved. Let's put it this way. Today the dodo is extinct. If this law had been followed, we would have dodos still in existence. They wouldn't be an extinct bird at all. But this law was is, uh, thrown underfoot as an arbitrary law of God that can be abandoned, and it was, and there's no more dodos. And this is a uh, pervading problem. Most things that look at first glance to be arbitrary or anything but. when we So we're, I've always said it this way. Trust God's word and let modern science catch up. Modern science is provisional anyway, and the word of God is not provisional. It is it is a established in heaven forever. So it's a firm foundation. It's a rock, capital R, that you can stand on. And then let modern science or let modern culture catch up to God. God's way out ahead of everybody else on any of this. So I think when theonomists start to give away points, uh, that's when they get in trouble. And, it, and it's an unfortunate uh, conflict. So if a Reconstructionism does not uh, assert a biblical ethics uh, based on the law, and anchored in the law of God, I think they're throwing away the, what Dr. Gary North Polly rightly called the tool of Reconstruction. And you can't do much without the tool. You can have evangelical hope for the gospel, and you can have uh, debates online using uh, presuppositional apologetics. But where the rubber hits the road is man's relationship to God and man's relationship to man, and that is mediated by the law of God. And if you throw the law of God out, then you have uh, a non-mediated interaction between individuals, and you have revolution and war and bloodshed. So I think it's important for us to recover a strong theonomy. And I believe we start with, say, Warfield's view of theonomy, which I think is even better than most 20th, 20th century versions. Uh, that was the way the... Uh, the Princetonian saw it, and I think it's worth taking a look. All right, blessings to all, and uh, Calcium Foundation will see you all in two weeks. And um, again, we look forward to these events. Send your questions in advance, and we'll be glad to answer them and put them front burner when we meet again. Goodbye, all.